But without further ado, I have my next guest on board, Luis Ortiz Cathedral. Back from the brink again, the conservation of the Norfolk Island green parrot is going to be our topic. Lewis is a conservation biologist and wildlife manager from Mexico, specializing on recovering populations of threatened island vertebrates. He has studied wild parrots in New Zealand and Australia for 17 years. In the last decade, he has also led recovery programs for mockingbirds, iguanas, and terrestrial snakes in the Galapagos Islands. Lewis will talk about the recovery of the critically endangered Tasman parakeet on Norfolk Island and the crucial role of partnerships to ensure the conservation of species. I hope I got all of that information correct and right, adequate. And so without further ado, I am bringing on board. Lewis, how's it going today? Kia ora, Maynard. Pretty good. Pleasure. Happy to be here. Yes, yes. And, and I am excited to have you. I just read through all your credentials, and these are all things that I absolutely love and enjoy. I'm excited to hear a little bit about the work that you do, because it ties into everything that we're talking about today. We got we just got our youth involved and energized in ways that they can protect the environment. We talked about ways that we can utilize technology and innovation to help protect our environment. Now we get to hear from you about some specific things, some specific organisms, creatures that you're working with, and things that are being, uh, the ways that they're being a affected by climate change and and, uh, and things that we're doing to our environment. So I'm excited for this conservation. I'll let you take it away, um, and then I'll come on board with a little quick Q&A afterwards. Thanks, Maynard. Cheers. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> um, OK, now I'm just going to bring this up. So um, I believe you can see my screen now. Um, as Maynard mentioned, I'm going to talk about the recovery of the critically endangered uh, Norfolk parrot or green parrot or green parrot uh, on Norfolk Island. Uh, but before I start, I would like to uh, introduce myself with a pepeka, which is a traditional Maori introduction that connects the person to a place and a history. Ko ilushtake te maunga, ko atlistak te awa, ko mestizo te apu, no Mexico Ahau, Colovis Ortiz Catedral, Tokoingua. This is a traditional Maori introduction that is gaining more and more momentum. And it ties nicely with some of the work that we've um, heard before about the importance of indigenous perspectives in conservation. And a little bit about me. So I was born in Mexico. And from an early age, I was interested in wildlife, uh, which led me to play with some very cool creatures and um, organisms. And um, one of my major interests around my mid-20s um, was uh, studying the populations of, of parrots. Um, this photograph was from when I was doing my master's about- Hey, Lewis, I'm just going to jump in here. Well, we want to see, we'd love to see the screen share. I don't know if the, sc uh, the screen is actually shown right now for uh, the topics that you're discussing. If you try your sh uh, screen share once again, uh, we could all be able to see the lovely pictures you're describing. Oh, it didn't show. My bad. Mm -hmm. You could possibly uh, yeah. try stopping it and then uh, resharing again and then see if that works. Is this better? Mm -hmm. Can you uh, see? It? Let's see. Yep. There we go. You're good oh. to go. Right. So I went through two minutes already and you missed that one, but <laughs> um, I'll take it from here. Thanks, Maynard. So, um, yeah, I was talking about my early interest on parrot conservation, and um, this is a photograph of a kakariki, or a New Zealand parrot. And um, I started my, my journey in parrot conservation in New Zealand. Um, I came here to study a master's and uh, kind of never left, really. And the reason why New Zealand is so important for this kind of work is that um, it is strategically placed in an area with a lot of islands and a lot of the species in need of conservation. So the polygon in yellow that you can see here represents the historical distribution of um, parakeets related to um, the kakariki I showed earlier. And these are the different species that I'm referring to. So as you can see, they are very homogeneous in their coloration. They are all predominantly green. Uh, with a bit of red and yellow, but they all have different evolutionary histories. And they are part of a conglomerate of about 25 or 30 species of parrots, depending on the taxonomic approach that you use in the South Pacific, um, that um, have undergone um, a major hit in terms of their numbers, and some of them are actually extinct. 
if we classify the same species according to the uh, globally acknowledged uh, main categories of threat, we'll find them distributed um, um, like this. And as you can see, a few are extinct, others are critically endangered, and so on. And the reason for the extinction and threatening of many populations lies in the introduction of introduced species to uh, these islands. So stoats, uh, brush-tailed possums, rats, um, feral cats, as well as uh, feral dogs have uh, caused a lot of damage to the communities, animal communities of these islands. And in this graph, which is a little, a little bit outdated, but I like it because it represents visually very well what's happening. So we have uh, the um, decrease in forest cover in New Zealand, followed by the arrival of humans, and also the decrease in the number of um, uh, species up to the year 2000. And from 2000 to now, um, a few other populations have also been affected. Now, um, when parrot populations are um, affected by predators, not only do we lose uh, these beautiful animals, but as you can see in this video, we lose a uh, part of their very important ecological role. Um, parrots are predominantly seed predators, and in doing so, they reduce the seed set of many plants. This is um, an ecological role that shapes the forests of uh, the South Pacific and also the world, wherever there are parrots. That role is being hijacked by introduced rats, which are now the ones predominantly eating the seeds. Um, parrots are also part of the cultural expression of um, the communities in Pacifica. And as you can see in the roof uh, of this building, for instance, we have some beautiful patterns. Uh, one of those patterns, known as Nutu Kaka, is inspired by the shape of the bill of the Kaka parrot. So as we lose parrots, we not only we lose the species and the ecological role, but also part of our cultural identity. So for the New Zealand uh, Red Crown Kakariki, um, uh, we conducted a number of projects aimed at rewilding the Hauraki Gulf. This is the northern part of New Zealand. And what you see here are uh, the distribution or the records of the species um, up to the year 2005. Uh, predominantly, they are restricted to offshore islands where these predators haven't been um, uh, introduced or where they have been removed and that has created a space for the parrots to increase in numbers. And for my PhD studies, we wanted to uh, restart populations of Kakariki in areas where they historically, historically occur. And the way you do that is by catching them on nets like this. And once you uh, capture the birds, you put them safely on a helicopter and release them. And over time, you have situations like this where um, people can interact with these animals that are very tame and that's why they are so susceptible to predators in their new homes. So once again, this is the reintroduction, the distribution of the parakeets to the year 2005. This is the distribution to the year 2018, following these reintroductions. More specifically, zooming in to the Hauraki Gulf, the locations where uh, are now found uh, are represented here in yellow. So it's a very effective um, approach to rewild uh, these areas and restore the ecological role of these birds. B more broadly speaking, in the North Island, uh, a similar situation happened and their arrows indicate locations where um, the translocation of, of this kakariki has made that difference. So with that kind of background, I became involved in the conservation of the Tasman parakeet, which inhabits Norfolk Island. And uh, this is more or less their sound. Some people ask me what they sound like. It's very loud. So that gives them their name, that kiki kiki kiki, as well as their color, kakariki. Um, and the Norfolk Island parrot is very closely related to New Zealand kakariki. Um, but um, historically has taken a, a greater hit in terms of their numbers. It used to occur on Lord Howe and Norfolk Island, but is now restricted to Norfolk Island alone. And early settlers consider them a plague because they will feed on crops and um, they were hunted on Lord Howe, um, hunted to extinction. And they also became extinct on Phillip Island, which is a smaller island closer to the shores of Norfolk. And by the 70s, it was just restricted to a small uh, patch on the northern side of the island. By the 80s, there were few, fewer than 50 birds. And between the uh, 
early 80s to the year 2009, there was um, an increase in management that boosted the numbers to about 250 birds. However, um, to the year 2013, the a conservation priorities and management style on the island change, and that actually have an impact that wasn't detected immediately uh, on the green parrots. Um, following a survey in 2013, we encountered that there were between 50 and 100 birds and mostly males. So this is the, the second dip in numbers um, in recent times for the species. Now, Norfolk Island is not very big. We have here um, the island and the distance you can see Phillip Island. What you see in green is the Norfolk Island uh, National Park, which is about 300 hectares in size. And to give you a sense of how big that is uh, in the northern part of the island, as you can see here in green, that's equivalent to the size of Central Park. So not a lot of forest left. So the species is really reduced to this subtropical forest. This is what it looks like. Um, this is an aerial view and it is actually quite an incredible place. And the reason why they are so susceptible to changes in management is because of their habit of foraging on the ground for seeds. As you can see here, this, for, this video was taken about a meter away from the birds and they were not exhibiting any anti-predatory behavior. So that spells bad news for them. Here we have a feral cat as part of the trapping program on Norfolk Island and feral cats eat green parrots. So it is definitely a key element in controlling them to uh, reduce cat numbers. Another um, uh, predator of nesting females are rats. And in this um, uh, photo, you can see the rat climbing up a nest. So this motivated um, um, a partnership between different agents and organizations and individuals to start action on the ground and save them from near extinction. And this schematic is important in the sense that it highlights the elements that a successful recovery program uh, should contain. And I highlighted in red the ones that um, apply very well to the green parrot or Tasman parakeet case. Um, recovery is um, implemented by a champion, um, adequate funding and science-based approaches. And these champions are the rangers on this uh, island, they are actually the ones doing the heavy lifting and the hard work. My role has been facilitating the transfer of knowledge and skills um, that I learned in New Zealand so the recovery of the species could be implemented. And um, this includes things like checking nests and monitoring the growth of parrots and parakeets, um, making health checks uh, to ensure that they are developing well in protected nests where predators don't uh, get them. And if you go online to the Invasive Species Council of Australia, you can read in more detail how this um, control of rats um, is being implemented. It also started the conversation, <clears throat> can the Norfolk parakeet be safe from extinction once and for all, for instance. So there are a lot of resources there that can give you a bit more context. We also started a pride campaign um, calling the parrot, our parrot, our pride. And this was in the form of uh, these posters that were displayed on stores and hotels and public spaces, and also showing all the uh, different partners that took uh, that played a role in the recovery of the species. And that actually had a huge impact uh, with the with the local community as well, interacting with us directly, not necessarily. Um, just seen from afar with being part of the recovery. And a green parrot turns from this into this fluffy nest, uh, fluffy mess within about 60 days. And so um, we use the number of chicks that were hatching as a measure of success of the program. And we have cameras installed that will give us an idea of how many chicks were uh, hatching and fledgling from each of the nests. And just to give you an idea of the success of the project to date, uh, we have that between 2013 and 2017, so that's only four years since we started this program, 235 chicks um, had fledged, and that represents a 60% fledging success. This is a 30% increase from the baseline that we had from the 90s, so um, this is uh, also very good news. And overall population, the number of parrots that are on the park uh, increase by 126%. We detected a number of nests that were not um, directly managed, that they started nesting in natural cavities. Um, so that was also uh, pretty good. 
um, to aid in the recruitment of more birds in the place. And we started having sightings like this, groups of five or more parrots. Um, the largest flock recorded that I know of is about 20. If you go on Facebook, enjoy the Norfolk Island uh, bird group, you'll see photos like this. This is a 12 plus flock of green parrots feeding on the ground. And if you look at the comments, the, the local community there are very excited about this, this kind of sighting. And look at them, they are all eating seeds. They are all destroying uh, the seed set of many plants. Um, and in doing so, they will reshape the way the forests uh, recover. Now, going back to this map in the green areas in Norfolk Island National Park, this is what the recovery of the species look uh, within three years. So we have uh, the locations where we encountered them in blue, and uh, in the year 2016, we can see an, an expansion. The most recent uh, kind of work has revealed that they are now moving outside the park and trying to colonize um, other areas. So all of that is good news. And this has also helped shape the career of young conservationists. This is one of my students collecting data in the field. So she's now one of the um, young scientists that can also take part of change like this. If you go to ABC Radio Australia online, you can listen to Joel um, describe as he measures chicks at a nest. Um, so now uh, we have uh, many more uh, recent developments from the park that you can follow through social media as well, which is great. And looking at the future, now we have an opportunity to reintroduce um, parakeets to islands where they were eradicated um, uh, from, for instance, Lord Howe Island or Phillip Island, close to uh, the Norfolk Island coastline. And the work doesn't really end there. So the broader kind of area, the polygon that I'm presenting here, encompasses the distribution of the parrot species that I uh, showed in another um, slide. We're talking about a 9 million square miles uh, area that includes 15 countries where more than 50 languages are spoken and uh, where we have about 8% of the global parrot diversity. And the threats that we need to manage are actually similar to those that have um, once managed made a difference in terms of the recovery of the red crown parakeet in New Zealand and the Tasman parakeet. Some of these are very small islands. To give you a sense of the size, look at the uh, landing strip on this island. It takes up a lot of the land available. So these are small areas where um, a kind of surgical conservation intervention can make the difference for uh, a number of parrot species, such as the prosopeias. Uh, we also have um, uh, the uh, seret from Micronesia. We have the New Caledonian parakeet or um, the loris as well that are found in, um, in various of the islands. So these composite of the species could benefit greatly from implementing these kind of actions using a similar approach to what work on Norfolk Island. So this is work in progress. Um, a recent study showed that out of the islands of the world, the ones that you see here uh, represented, if we strategize the eradication of uh, introduced predators that humans brought in, uh, we'll see a recovery of over 100 vertebrate species. And many of those are actually these parrots. And their recovery also means a recovery of their ecological role the um, control of the seed set of many plants uh, and a reshaping of the forests that will be more close to what uh, historically they were once the effect of rats predominantly uh, is removed. And a lot of the work uh, on other islands uh, that I also uh, participate in involves uh, organizations like Island Conservation, the Galapagos National Park, uh, the Galapagos Conservation Trust, more recently Rewild, we have an exciting project there with the uh, elusive pink iguana. So it doesn't end with parrots. There are opportunities for this kind of work um, on a range of vertebrates. So if you go to the World Parrot Trust website, you can learn about the work we do and how we are trying to lead uh, the conservation work needed in this region uh, for parrot uh, recovery. And of course, I'm, I'm here talking to you, but I'm, I'm only one of a large partnership of individuals and organizations um, that make this work possible. Namihe Ehoma, thank you for your attention. And I think we have time for a few questions. Thank you.
Yes, yes, that was absolutely amazing. It was that was fantastic. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, take off your screen share there for you. Thank you so much for that. And I was I was so excited to hear a little bit more about your work. Um, you know, we've been having fantastic fantastic discussions today about conservation, different things that we can do to protect our ecosystems and environments. And you're able to touch on specifically uh, focusing on a, on a particular species that's been drastically affected. So it's good to hear that specific perspective uh, and, and seeing uh, your field work. So thank you very much for that. Um, I have a quick question for you in regards to uh, you know the primary reason that uh, that this parrot species has been affected in New Zealand, and we're talking about invasive species, um, which is kind of which is a really unique element because you know we've been focused on climate change and and habitat loss and all these different things and we haven't touched too much on uh, invasive species but it's a huge problem in many uh environments and many ecosystems and particularly uh this one what are some what are some uh steps that either people in the region um and even other places where invasive species are having an effect on different organisms uh what are simple steps or beginning steps that we can take to reduce that introduction of invasive species, find ways to, to limit that and be more cognizant about it on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it will depend a lot on where you live, of course. In New Zealand, for instance, people can uh, register to volunteer and trap in their backyard, for instance, set up traps for introduced species or uh, manually remove some of the weeds that cause problems because introduced species also involve plants. In mm -hmm. other parts of the world, it, well, and this applies also to other islands. In uh, mainland areas, non-island non situations, the kind of work that uh, could be done be uh, informing what, uh, what sort of species can have the potential to become invasive. It is not unusual to hear of people releasing pets they do not no longer want into the wild and those become a pest. So. Yeah, maybe don't do that. Yeah. If you're aware of the of the kind of plants and animals that can become a problem, um, you know, you have a chance to be uh, responsible with that. In terms of um, domestic animals, a responsible cat ownership is, is a must. Um, yeah. The statistics of the number of birds that are lost um, to domestic cats is just staggering. And so, it doesn't necessarily need to be a confrontational discussion because this ultimately is for the well-being and animal welfare of your own pet. So learning about how to look after your cat in a responsible manner that prevents um, you know, losing some native animals to them uh, is, is paramount to that. And just conversing, reaching out to, to people, we all want the same kind of outcomes, broadly speaking. So the channels are open so we can together uh, work towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very important, and and that's a that and that's a big issue because we even even here locally where I'm at here in in Los Angeles, California, uh, I have my little my little sister. She's involved in 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 capturing uh, uh, cats. There's so many domestic cats that are just out and about uh, having kittens, and you have this drastic uh, population of just street cats <laughs> roaming freely everywhere, and that's here in the city. So I can't even imagine when they have an actual habitat where their food sources and different things like that. How much of an effect that could have and a lot of times we're not cognizant about that so that's really important that you bring that up for us to be more aware about that absolutely and all of that is also tied at a kind of macro level with climate change because the forests that we have actually are not what um, ecologically they are supposed to be they are being reshaped by all, all of these introduced species and losing things like parrots this kind of winged gardeners if you want mm -hmm. um, it's also limiting our ability to to become resilient on island systems to climate change mm -hmm. so restoring parrot populations controlling invasive species populations and in due course uh, restoring forests to their ecological uh, function functionality can give us that resilience in small atolls and islands in the south pacific Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. Um, and, uh, one thing that really I find shocking, uh, you talked about the habitat that this parrot uh, currently resides in. And, uh, and I believe you compared it, uh, I believe, to Central Park in, in New York, which, uh, you know, if you've been to New York, we've been to Central Park and it seems big just because it's a, it's a plot of environment in the middle of the city, but it's not a huge lot of land. Uh, and so for that to be the only remaining ecosystem left for this parrot is m absolutely mind blowing. Uh, is there any work being done to possibly introduce the parrot into different areas? 
uh, thought process is about trying to increase its habitat. I know now it becomes a uh, it becomes kind of this catch twenty one plus because now you know we talk about invasive species. You don't want to introduce it to areas now where it can have another impact. Um, but what's kind of the thought process about expanding uh, its habitat? Well, the technology to control invasive species in a responsible and human manner is evolving as well. So we are becoming better at doing that. And also biosecurity protocols to stop species from becoming established. And so you don't have to fix that problem. You prevent it from happening. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the Norfolk Island National Park and the Department of uh, the Environment in Australia are conducting an ambitious replanting program within the island and neighboring properties to yeah. produce more more food for the parrots you know so in the long run i think the the prospect of the of the species is uh, positive and there are certainly a few more areas where they could establish but it, it really comes down as you said to keeping them away from areas where they could uh, die to to predators but um I, i'm i'm still quite um impressed by how much we've accomplished kind of putting um our own horn in a way but in this short term, we really managed to avert another extinction in the region because they were in very, very low numbers. So it's a huge team effort and uh, it is ongoing. So if you, there's at the moment a very uh, important research being done as well. So universities play a role. We have um, Daniel Gatouche and Rob Heinsohn from ANU uh, also figuring out better ways to understand how parrots move in the environment and what they need. So all of that information just keeps flowing. It will help yeah. us save more species by applying the same model. Nice, nice. Now, that's that was actually great. Interesting, you brought up the uh, biosecurity, and uh, this kind of ties into what I wanted to talk about in 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 regards to what we listened to earlier about new technology and innovation uh, when it comes to conservation. What kind of a good thing you and you brought up, you know, with some of the students and and others that you're working with. What are kind of some new methods outside the box things that people may not be aware of that's being implemented? New strategies we're actually utilizing more technology and innovation. And you mentioned biosecurity, uh, but what are some you know, especially for people that are working with corporations? I do a lot of stuff within the tech space as well, and I'm trying to find ways to get tech companies thinking more on that conservation, environmental mm -hmm. awareness side of things, and how they could strategically use it to you know for electronics and different things like that to better our environment. What kind of tools, methods? things that are on the horizon or currently use, uh, that you're utilizing uh, where you can implement technology for conservation? Yeah, actually, Andrew Digby covered that very well with his talk about the Kakapo. And one of the things um, that has a lot of potential is, for instance, the use of drones, not just to apply, um, you know, whatever is needed to control the species, but also to monitor um, populations of rare uh, birds um, if there are any parrot researchers listening to this, they will agree that they are difficult to count and monitor. So at the moment, um, you know, there are prototypes of drones that can actually help you monitor those numbers. And then you have a better uh, use of time and, you know, uh, planning. Um, another approach is also the um, setting up of more effective um, uh, nesting boxes. You can just add a little digital lock and key system to let in the right species and not the wrong species, you know, mm -hmm. and that can make the difference between having an active nest or a nest that is taken over by a predator. So um, there are little things like that. And we certainly uh, have many needs as well. So starting this conversation with uh, technology minded people is, is what will make the difference in the long run. Yes, absolutely. That is amazing. Thank you so much. Lou. This was fantastic. Love your perspective. Love hearing the work that you're doing and the continued work that you're going to be doing uh, to protect this uh, wonderful species. I have New Zealand on my list to visit in the near future. So hopefully by the time I get there, this organism is still well and alive and thriving so I can see it myself in person. <laughs> absolutely. We'll, we'll show you a good time. Get in touch. Yes, yes, I look forward to it. Thank you so much. You have a, re a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Maynard. See awesome, ya. awesome. Take care.